You know, there's some, uh, some Christmas carols out there. One of them, I don't know, you could probably finish this for me if I started singing it, but it goes, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Have you heard this one? It's the most wonderful time. And then there's another verse. Do you know about this one? It, it says this, it's the hap, happiest season of all, right? We sing a song, I don't think we're singing it today, but we do sing a song uh, called Joy to the World. And this Christmas, a lot, it's all about joy and happiness, and, and we say Merry Christmas, we say Happy Holiday, we say, we say all, this, all this stuff. And yet I find that Christmas like, it has this tension in it. We almost had this, this tension this morning. We were, we were calling back and forth and texting back and forth. I'm like, are we going to be able to have church today? Are they going to open the roads? Like, I, I mean, there's this, this tension between what we want to experience, the joy, the, the happiness, the togetherness, the familiness of Christmas, and, and sometimes what the reality is. Because what we hope for, and I imagine what you're hoping for, is you're going to leave this place and go eat delicious food and be with people that you want to be with, hopefully open presents that are, are something that you care about and want and, and have hoped for. Hopefully that's what is in store for us all the next few days. However, I find Christmas can also be a difficult time. It can be a time where, where we, we want it to be joyful and happy, but maybe it reminds us of something. Maybe we've lost someone that we care about or love this year or in the past few years. And so the Christmas season gathering around is a reminder, a fresh reminder maybe, that they're not with us. So there's a little bit of that tension. There's the joy, but then there's also the reality. There's the sadness, a little bit of, if you want to call it heartbreak. Maybe, maybe it's not that. Maybe for you or... Someone you know, there's, there's relationships out of whack. Everybody knows, like family can be difficult. Or am I the only one with a family like that? I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> nervous laughter. <clears throat> family can be tough, right? And no matter how hard we try, maybe, maybe family relationships aren't what we would hope or what we want. And maybe the time around the tree is like a time of awkwardness or coldness or a reminder that someone's not here because they're upset. There's unforgiveness. There, there can be lots of things in families. Maybe it's a, a time of year where you're just feeling pressed with finances. We talk about gift giving and all these things that we're going to do, but you look at your checkbook and you think, man, I just don't have very much. There's this tension, I think, at Christmas. What we want it to be full of joy and happiness and merrymaking and, and all of that. But then we look around and the world so often is full of something else. It's so full of heartbreak. But this evening, in the next few minutes, I want to I wanna, once again just remind us why we have reason to rejoice. Even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of hardship, even in the midst of heartbreak, there's reason for joy and reason for hope, and it all goes back to that baby in a manger. We're going to do this in a little bit of an unorthodox way. If you have a Bible or if you have one on your phone, you want to turn with me, we're going to look at the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 to 19, and then we're going to turn, just flip over to a few verses in the New Testament that relate directly to Jesus. And I think there we're going to see some things that are helpful maybe in reminding us why we can rejoice even if, if we live in a world that has tension in it where everything isn't maybe exactly the way that we would want. Genesis chapter 3. If you don't know anything about the Bible, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Chapter 3 is kind of the pivot point where everything that was created good goes south in a hurry. After Genesis chapter 3 is the first man and the first woman fall into sin. And we're going to pick up the story in verse 9 where uh, God is first confronting them right after they've fallen into sin. Genesis 3 and verse 9 and following says this, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, and, and this is the question that kind of struck me as I was thinking about it, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? That's, this is God speaking. Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? 
The man, in classic human fashion, notice what he does, passes the buck. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Courageous. (laughs) Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman, equally courageous, said, the serpent. I don't know where he came from, but this crazy serpent, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So then God's going to pronounce to the, the serpent, the woman, and the man the results of what they've done. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and, your, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And then if you have a Bible, you're going to underline a verse. This is like the key verse that is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen at Christmas. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And then this little bit, which is just so important, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. If we flip over to the first book in the New Testament, the book of Matthew... It says this in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this, in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This morning or this afternoon, evening, whatever it is right now, we're going we're gonna to just look at a, a couple things that we see in this text. We're going to look at kind of the bad news, which I already alluded to. is that Though the world, we, we want it to be full of rejoicing, so often it can be full of other things, and Christmas can be a reminder of those things. But the good news is that in spite of all of that, Christmas means something wonderful, that God hasn't abandoned us here, that He's come near to us to do something about the heartache and the brokenness that we find in the world. And then I would just want to end by asking the same question that God asks the first man and the first woman. So this is what we, what we see in, in the text is that the, the world is full of heartbreak, whether it's like somebody who passed on this year or whether it's some, somebody who you don't, you're not getting on well with or if it's financial trouble or, or, or some kind of diagnosis or so, something else. We all know. We have this sense, right? The world is full of heartbreak and Christmas is not exempt. We kind of try to, try to like create this little happy bubble around Christmas and we're taking time off and we're eating good food and we're hopefully watching the Vikings win. Um, I heard they were up at halftime, so in case you were wondering, but... But we we try to create this little Christmas happy bubble. But then we'll go back to our normal lives and and maybe even inside of that bubble of of Christmas we'll have little whiffs that the world is kind of full of stuff we wish it wasn't full of. It's full of heartbreak. There's all sorts of heartbreak. And the Bible is unequivocal. That heartbreak is not because we don't know enough. It's not because we don't have enough. It's not because uh, of, of some kind of other thing. It's because... Something inside of us as people is broken. We sin. The world is full of heartbreak because of sin. We see the first heartbreak. This is just what jumped off the page at me in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 9. The Lord God called to the man right after they had sinned, and he he said to him, where are you? 
And this struck me because I'm a young dad. Well, I'm not that young, but uh, I'm a dad. And sometimes I, I have kids and I want to locate my kids in the house. When I'm calling out to them to locate them in the house, I'm not, I'm not saying it like this. I'm not saying, hey, where are you? I'm yelling their name as loud as I possibly can. And if they're in a lot of trouble, guess what I'm using? I'm using their middle name as well, right? That's when they know they're, they're, in, they're in for a world of hurt if I find them. I'm not saying gently to them, where are you? But here we have this amazing question. And as I, I listen to it, I can't help but think that it is spoken with sadness, and with tones of loss, with the flavor of heartbreak in the, the intonation of the words by God, because God doesn't, He's not asking an information question. God knows exactly where they are. He knows everything. He's not trying to figure out where their location is. Instead, He is experiencing something for maybe one of the very first times in, in his existence as God, where, where the, the people that he has been in relationship with, they're out of sync with him now. And so when I hear this question, it just, it's just the, it's the heartbreak of God. Where are you? So the man goes into the explanation, you know, hey, I, I was afraid because I was naked. God's like, hey, you weren't worried about being naked yesterday. What happened? comes out, they blame down the line, he blames the woman, woman blames the serpent, and then God says, here's what's going to happen. More heartbreak. Verse 16. To the woman, he said, oh, surely multiply your pain in childbearing. That which you were, you were created uniquely to, to accomplish in this world and, and like get, derive great joy from, it's going to be exceedingly painful. It's going to be exceedingly difficult. I think you could extrapolate this and take it just the, just the whole experience of child bearing, child rearing. It's very, it's hard. And moms, oftentimes, this falls heavy on moms. And there's heart, there can be heartbreak there. If you see your child hurt, you see your, your child making decisions that are not easy, there's heartbreak. God says that's going to be part of the deal now because we live in a broken world. It wasn't what it was supposed to be. He goes on in verse 16. Not only are you going to have heartbreak there, you're going to have heartbreak. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. The, the relationship, the first man-woman relationship, there was no conflict. They didn't need a date night every week to get on the same page. They didn't have conflict or communication issues. Can you imagine? Even, even the best marriages today, like if you have a really popping marriage, you know, that you have a weekly whatever date night and you're doing all these things that people tell you to do and you're, you're just on the same page. You know how much work that takes? Can you imagine having the kind of harmonious, joy-filled relationship effortlessly? That's what it was like. And God says, God says to the woman, hey, it's going to be hard now. You're not going to be on the same page. You're going to be fighting and he's bigger than you, so he's going to rule over you. And there, there's a whole history there that we could talk about. Just heartbreak. Verse 17. To Adam, he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Be cursed is the ground because of you. Look what he says. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. In chapter 2, God t took Adam to the garden and he told him, Hey, I, I want you to, I'm going to put you here. You're supposed to guard it. You're supposed to tend it, keep it. Those two things. It's your purpose. And there was going to be joy in that. There wasn't, the, the word toil wasn't there. But how many of us as men, we, now our jobs, they're, they're full of toil and they're difficult. And they wear us out and they wear us down. It's not the way it was supposed to be, but that's the way it is now. In pain you shall eat of it, he says, all the days of your life. Verse 19, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Not only is it going to be toil, but you're going to toil all your life, and then you're going to go back to what you came from, to dust. Heartbreak of God, heartbreak of the woman, heartbreak of the man. And friends, we, we feel that heartbreak all the way to today, don't we? And we feel it. If you turn over to, to Matthew, we, we meet a guy and he's experiencing heartbreak, Joseph. Like I can't imagine. It 
It says, now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, and betrothal in those days wasn't easily broken off. It actually had to go through a legal process to, to dissolve it. She was betrothed to Joseph. It was very clear. They, they belonged together as husband and wife, though they weren't living together yet. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Heartbreak. And this man, as he sees like the life that he had dreamed about and wanted and made plans towards, just shattered right in front of him in a moment when he found out the news. Heartbreak. And we see what he does his, in his broken heart, though he's still a good man, and her husband, Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Okay, that dream is over. We're going to close the door on that. Put it behind me. Move on as best I can with life. You just see heartbreak. And that what the Bible says is that the world is full of heartbreak. My heartbreak in whatever situations I have going on, your heartbreak in whatever is going on in your life is the result of one thing, and it's the result of sin. And that's bad news. It's not a very fun, like, Christmas Eve sermon, in all honesty, but, but you have to tell the bad news to get to the good news. And the good news is that Christmas, and this is why we rejoice, Christmas is the beginning of God healing the heartbreak in the world. This is, this is so interesting, because in the first two chapters of Genesis, God created everything good. Everything that exists that is good is from Him. The Bible is clear on that. Everything that we're going to enjoy together in the next few days with family and friends is a gift from Him. And that's the way the first man, the first woman existed, and then sin, sin entered the world. But in that moment that sin entered the world, God made a promise to Adam and to Eve and to us and, and that, that he was going to do something to undo all of the damage that sin had done to the world. We see it in what he says to the serpent. He addresses the serpent, which is interesting. The serpent in the story is Satan. And he says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And then verse 15, I'm going to put enmity, he says, between you and the woman. And don't miss this, and between your offspring and her offspring. So now there's this idea that from this woman is going to come an offspring who's going to be at enmity with the seed, with the, the offspring of the serpent. And then notice what he says. He, the offspring, he, very specific, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And here, right at the beginning, we see the heart of our God, that He wasn't content to leave the world in, in heartbreak. He said, I'm going to do something. It might take a while, but there's going to be this, this son who's going to come, and he's going to begin to undo all of the mess that you find yourself in. He's going to heal the heartbreak. So if we go back to Matthew, we see Joseph, this heartbroken Heartbroken guy. And notice what the story says. As he considered these things, he's pondering his broken heart. What should I do? Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph, you think that she betrayed you. You think she went outside of your marriage vows and she got pregnant by some random guy. That's what you think. I'm telling you, that is not what happened. God is working something amazing and the power of God came upon her. And this, this child is going to be something special. This child is going to be the seed, the offspring, the Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 spoke of thousands of years before. Verse 21, she will bear a son. Remember it said, he will bruise your head. 
Here the prophecy is fulfilled. She will bear a son, a he. And then he goes on, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. See, it comes full circle in Jesus. Jesus' name means my God is salvation or my God saves. And so he is the fulfillment of the promise that God made in Genesis 3 in verse 15. He's the one who's come to heal the heartbreak of the world. And we see in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, little glimpses of that. We see that in his death, he atoned for our sins on the cross. He absorbed our sin in his body on the cross. So that if we just call out to him, say, Jesus, I believe in you, please save me. That's what he does. He, he takes our sin, he took our sin, and he offers us his, his righteousness, his holiness, his perfection. But he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead. And one of the things that breaks our heart is when a loved one dies. Here's the deal. Because of Jesus, if our loved ones know Jesus, guess what? That, that, that death is, is just, it's a blip on the screen. If they know Jesus, we know Jesus. Because someday their bodies are going to be resurrected like his was, and our body is going to be resurrected like his, and we are going to live into a new, wonderful reality. Not only that, but he sent his spirit. You know, the only thing that can heal relationships in our life is when there is work done in the hearts of two individuals. I'm not saying come to Christ and all your, all your problems will be, will be uh, taken care of. But there'll be hope. Because the Holy Spirit who lives in me and who lives in, in you, if you know him, he delights to bring reconciliation. See, Jesus came to begin to heal the heartbreak in our world. And, and the scriptures are clear. Someday he's going to fulfill it. He's going to finish the job. No longer are we going to live in a world where there is joy and heartbreak together. But we're going to enter into a, a kingdom of joy and happiness and light and music. And, there, and everything else will be gone. That's what the Bible says. And the baby in the manger is the very, he's the beginning. He's the promise of that. And that's why we rejoice. That's why we, we can rejoice in him no matter what's going on in the world. Because he came to heal the brokenness, fix the heartbreak. And he wants to walk alongside you and I in our heartbreak even today. So here's the, here's the question. It's God's question from Genesis 3, 9. Where are you? Maybe you're here this evening and you, you came because your mom made you come. And that's fine. We're glad you're here with us to celebrate Christmas. Or you came because this is what your family's doing and you don't normally come to church. Hey, that's, that's great. We are glad you are here with us. But here's the question. Where are you? I believe God is calling out to each and every one of us he longs to have a relationship with us. He longs to draw close to us. He longs for us to want to be close to him. And he says, where are you? Where are you? If you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, I would just invite you to do that. Because when you do that, that brings you close to God once again. It reconciles that relationship. It gives you a hope and a future. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside you. There's a whole bunch of things that happen. You can do that simply by saying, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, that you died on the cross for my sin, took your, my sin on yourself, that you rose again from the dead, and I want to trust you and I want to follow you. I'm not even sure what that means. And if that's you, if you've never done that, God is, I think, calling out to you saying, where, where are you? He longs to be near to you. That's why he sent his son. For those of us, maybe we've, we've trusted Jesus as our Savior.
Maybe the question is, have we really taken that in? I can, I can look at the world, and you, you can get kind of cynical, a little bit jaded, get a little bit hardened. Hey, yeah, the baby in the major is, is good, but man, look at the mess. Does it, really, does it really make a difference? I know what I need is I just need it to come up fresh. Focus on, on Him, on His name. I, in Matthew, it says, You shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. He wants to save us from our sins. He wants to save us from the heartbreak that goes, goes with it. And He promises that someday all of that is going to be something that we experience as His followers. So will I take my eyes off of the heartbreak and put them on him? That's a question. Because if I do that, if I answer God's call, where, where are you? And I say, I, I'm, I'm here, I want to I be near you if you don't know him. Or if I'm, I'm here and I'm a little bit jaded, cynical, hard-hearted, don't, don't know about all this joy and happiness at Christmas, we place our, our eyes on him. He longs to give us joy in Him. That's what He wants for us this Christmas season. So that, that's why we can, we can rightly say it's the most wonderful time of the year because it's a reminder of what God has done and what God is going to do in the future. It's the happiest season of all because though we experience heartbreak in this world, we know as followers of Jesus that one day all that will come to an end. And the baby in the manger is a promise to that. So we can, we can rightly say joy to the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your birth. Thank you that in your birth, you fulfilled the prophecy that happened so, so many years before. Lord, that, that even though we are in this waiting time, waiting for you to come again, Lord, we live in a broken world and sometimes it can beat us down. Lord, that we can have joy in you because we know that you are going to do what you said. You want to restore, you want to heal all that is broken. And so, Lord, I, I would pray that we would focus on that this Christmas season. Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't trusted you as their Savior, maybe they would do that for the first time. They would call upon your name. They would talk to somebody who, who brought them. Lord, they would uh, take that step to draw near to you by faith. And Lord, help us to rejoice in you this Christmas season. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.